Okay, so recently I heard a pastor share an analogy that I really liked, and it's that our relationship with God is like a Wi-Fi connection. Stay with me on this. Um, our, Our relationship with God doesn't require a physical connection, but if we actually have a relationship with God, our connection to him is always there. And the closer we are to God, meaning the more time we spend with him or the more time we spend getting to know him, the more we get to know him, the stronger our connection with God will be. And I love this analogy because the Bible tells us if Christ be lifted up, he will draw men in. And I don't I don't know if you know this, but but a Wi-Fi router can provide a stronger and wider connection at a higher point in your home. Um, prioritizing our connection with God, it blesses us, but it can also extend to bless those around us. And those blessings should be managed well. Our connection with God uh, provides benefits and opportunities, but it also means we can choose to connect to the wrong things. Um, and end up in broken places with uh, the virus of sin running rampant in our systems, right? Or worse, we could end up disconnected altogether. And I think the passage this most reminds me of is Psalm 23, which talks about how much blessing there is under God's care. But the contrast is the danger and pain of disconnecting for something else. So I guess I'm asking, Are you connected to the right thing? Let's talk about it. Hey, I'm I'm Pastor Corey J. And this is Earthly Good Conversations, where we talk weekly about practical ways to find and follow God. These conversations are part of an online space called Open Grove, a space uh, for questions and answers and prayers and conversations. And this is all with a purpose of getting you rooted in the reality of God and growing in the purpose of the kingdom. Now, look, I don't know your story. Maybe uh, you're a strongly and deeply rooted Christian who has been following Christ and serving in ministry for years. Maybe that's you, or maybe you're, you're fairly new to the faith and you're, you're still looking for direction or, or maybe this faith thing is real. Maybe it's real for you, but you have questions that nobody's answering, right? Or maybe, maybe this faith stuff is the question for you. Maybe you don't have big faith in what the Bible says. Maybe you don't have any at all. I I think that no matter which one of these things is true for you, this, this talk right here is for you. I want you to know that God intends to have a strong, beneficial, and overflowing connection with you. Before we get into the heart of it, though, (laughs) I want to read you something. Psalm 23 says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, this is one of my absolute favorite passages in the Bible. And it has so much to offer us, right? But in order for us to fully get the value, we need to understand a few things. We need to know about the author. We need to know about the context. We need to talk about the language. See, this is a psalm or a song of praise that was written by David. And we know a lot about David from the Bible. 
We know that David was a shepherd. We know he was a little brother. Uh, We know that he was a man after God's own heart. But he was also a man who committed terrible sin. David could also complain, but he could do it so beautifully. In fact, many of the psalms that David wrote are songs of lament, are are passionate expressions of, of grief or sorrow. And I say all that to say, David is so much like me and you. He worked hard and he had things that he cared about, just like us. He was looked at and looked over because others were thought to be better than him, just like us. He got opportunities and he made much of them, just like us. He had haters and detractors, just like us. He pursued God, something that each and every one of us are able to do. But he also committed sins in secret and in public, just like us. His life had highs. His life had lows, just like us. And when it wasn't what he wanted or liked, when life wasn't what he preferred, when people got on his nerves and and life was not all roses and sunshine, he complained and he wanted it to be known, just like us. David is perhaps one of the easiest people in the Bible to relate to. And many of his contributions to the Bible are laments, which is what makes a text like Psalm 23 so important. David understood the lows and the trials and the issues of life. And like many of us do through text messages and social media and sometimes our prayers, David was great at letting all of his grief out. So so when he pins a psalm exalting the Lord as a great shepherd deserving of our trust, we really ought to pay some attention. Not not only is the psalm exalting God as good and worthy of trust, but it paints this picture through the lens of something David knew a lot about, a shepherd and his sheep. And this is representative of God and his people. Clearly, this was a significant meaning a significant relationship to David. And we can, we can, we can grasp the depths of what this means. And then we can apply it to our lives, right? If we can grasp what it means, we can apply it to our lives. This is called context. Understanding the shepherd in relation to the sheep helps give us a clear view of God. Now, now back when this Psalm was written, the people it was written for would have a clear connection to this metaphor as sheep were prevalent in their time. In fact, most of them uh, would have been farmers and shepherds. They would have had land. They would have had a flock of sheep, right? Uh, The sheep and the shepherd were not unfamiliar to God's people. Uh, Most of them would have overseen a flock of what were called fatty tailed sheep, a, a, They were very docile, so easy to manage, easy to lead group of sheep, but they were also very prone to stray. Um, The shepherds of these sheep would be very attentive to their flocks, often even assigning names to each and every one of the sheep, and the sheep would respond to their names. Um, So this was a personal relationship. The shepherd would even constantly be on the lookout for sheep that needed individual attention and care due to sickness or other issues. And David gives in Psalm 23 the metaphor of shepherd and sheep as a portrait of how God takes care of his people um, and how his people are in constant need of his care. And God is steadfastly devoted to giving each of us care. So at this point, I'm confident of three things. God intends to lead us. God intends to provide for us and God intends to protect us. Now that we understand the author and the context, let's talk language. Psalm 23 reveals four things that characterize God's leadership and his lordship or his connection with his people as the good shepherd. And I think that each one of these reflects how we should respond to God. Right. Um, The first thing, number one, God is a provider. Verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The encompassing sense of God's providence as the shepherd is shown in David's words. Um, David says, I shall not want. But the phrase he says there is more aptly translated as I have need for nothing 
or I am deprived of nothing or I have need for nothing more. The word that is translated as want most uh, closely translates to lack, meaning David is saying that with the Lord as his shepherd, what more could he possibly want? Because he lacks nothing. The first verse is used to say that what God gives is more than enough. If we if all that we have is God, it, it's not merely that we have enough with God. We have an abundance in God. We have more than what we need. Number two. God gives direction and discipline. Verses two and three say, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He he leads me beside waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here, David leans into the metaphor of the shepherd and explores the characteristics of the relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. He makes me lie down in green pastures is a statement of care. It's a statement of direction, but it's also a statement of discipline. The verbs used here are in the present tense. And this means that at the time David is speaking, that he's writing this psalm, he's not speaking proverbially. He's not talking of some far off future tense, but he's saying that right in the time he's writing this psalm, David is experiencing relationship with the shepherd as part of the flock. He is currently being made to lie down in green pastures. He is currently being led beside waters. That is still waters. This is currently refreshing his soul. God is currently leading him in the paths of righteousness. And each of these things has its own distinct significance, right? For example, the green pastures. They represent sustenance, a place to consume and and recharge, but but also a place to rest, to enjoy peace, tranquility and, and safety provided by the shepherd. These verses embody tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. If this was a a Wi-Fi signal, right, the, the signal strength would be excellent. I mean, this is about as close as you can get to the source, right? So so being led by the waters or the still waters represents God's direction over sheep who are prone to wander and and perish if they have no direction. God leads these stubborn, wayward sheep beside waters that are calming, waters that give no threat to overtake them, waters that um, give no threat to carry these sheep away and kill them. Now, this was in contrast to larger bodies of waters like rivers, which may frighten the sheep or or, or bodies of water that were violent and and threatened to carry the sheep away into certain doom. And what that means is God is not taking those who belong to him, those who are connected to him anywhere where he is not prepared to lead them. And, And he is not allowing any temptation that is more than his people can bear as long as they are faithfully following him. It, it's as we follow God's lead that our souls are restored. We find the path of righteousness only as God shows us where they are. We, we live in a world where we're predisposed to be busy. Um, a, a world where we are quick to preoccupy our hands or our minds to be busy with things that are insignificant in comparison to God and what he has to offer. So instead of finding sustenance that God offers, we wander to junk. Instead of finding peace that God offers, we wander to conflict and nonsense. Instead of finding the rest that God offers, we find worry and pain and sleepless nights. Instead of finding the restoration God offers, we find fatigue and shame and self-pity. And we, we tend to stumble every which way but toward righteousness. But it's like, why will we do that, you know? We, we can be connected to God. We can belong to God. We can be connected to a good shepherd, a, a caring king. We, we can belong to him. And he has so much more to offer us. He is so much more to offer if we just follow him. Number three is that God protects. 
Number three is that God protects. Verses four and five say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Verses four and five play as two halves of the same metaphoric whole. Verse four continues the sheep shepherd dichotomy, right? Um, it, It proclaims a lack of fear, despite going through the valley of the shadow of death. And you have to understand this was a very treacherous place in those times. Um, valleys were treacherous for sheep because they were steep and they were narrow and they were dark. They were perfect places for predators to hide, to try and pounce on the sheep because there was limited space to scatter away from the predators. Um, There was limited space to run away from them, but the sheep had a sure place to put their trust in because the shepherd was skilled with the staff and the rod. These were tools that every shepherd had And they were used to guide the sheep, but they were also used to protect the sheep from predators. Um, In fact, it's believed by many that a common shepherd would be able to fend off most predators um, who were a threat with just these two instruments. Um, Shepherds were skilled with these tools and would have tremendous ability with them. In fact, most shepherds would be able to strike a mighty or deadly blow with their rod, um, even if they were throwing it from many yards away. So the sheep didn't have to fear because whether there was death lurking in the shadows or it only looked like there was a threat in the shadows, there was no threat that was worthy of fear more than the rod and staff of the shepherd was worthy of their trust. And and this imagery establishes God as a trustworthy shepherd who is then described in verse five as one who prepares a table for David in the midst of his enemies. And this breaks from the shepherd metaphor, but it speaks to David being in situations where God provided for him, even in the midst of threats from others. So, So let's not miss this important point because this works as a further demonstration of God's protection. David eats and drinks more than his fill in the midst of a perceived threat. This means that that those of us who belong to God are never outside of his protection, no matter what dangers are present. Like literally, if God's for us, then who can stand against us? Now that's a mighty proclamation, but we often don't feel that way, right? And because we don't often feel that way, we often don't live that way, right? And sometimes God has to save us from ourselves because we're in trying to get away from things that that honestly can't even harm us if we're with God. In a fight to get more comfortable with our position, we're actually ending up fighting to get away from God. Like our perspective is is like, God, I'm scared. God, this is going to hurt. This is this doesn't feel good. God, I have to get out of here. And sometimes we're fighting so hard to feel safe that we're actually fighting being under the protection of the only one that can keep us safe, the only one that can save us. And, And God, who is a good shepherd, has to actually save us from ourselves. Now, now let me go back to verse five for just a second, because there's something that verse five talks about that's just too good to ignore for us to not go deep on. And it's where it talks about anointing. Now, if you've been around Christian circles, there's a lot of talk about being anointed, right? Like we're so anointed. God has a special anointing, but anointing in the Bible has a particular meaning. See, sheep have lots of risk to their health. And two of those risks were a certain fly and a certain parasite. Now, the fly was called the summer fly or or the nose fly. And what these flies would do is they would fly around the sheep's head and eventually they would land and they would lay eggs in the nose of the sheep. And because um, uh, because the sheep had no protection, these eggs would hatch and the worms from the eggs would burrow into the nose of the sheep. 
and and these flies would go from being annoyance to a crazed induced nuisance that would cause the sheep to bash his head against the rocks bash his head against the trees bash his head against the ground trying to get these worms out and the sheep would often, to prevent this, try to run away from the fly altogether, which would cause it to fall prey to a predator outside of the flock or even die of exhaustion from running around. And since these flies would often result in serious injury or death of the sheep, the shepherd would remain vigilant for the first sign of the flies. And what they would do is they would anoint the head of the sheep with oil um, or special chemicals to keep the flies from landing in the sheep's ears and in their noses. And I think the parallel is that some some things that we perceive harmless as a fly are the very things that we allow to enter into and dominate our thought life. And just like these flies, just like these worms, they grow. And as they grow, they hinder us and they can harm us even to the point of death. So I I think about it like how many things that we think of as harmless as a fly do we let in, you know, A, a little gossip here, a little worry there, just a little less, you know, it won't hurt. But little by little, the sin grows and the influence of the sin grows. And before you know it, we're further and deeper than we ever intended to be. The flies weren't the only issue, though. There was also a parasite that could cause a deadly infection to break out among the sheep. Um, This parasite was an infection that was most commonly found around the head, but it was highly contagious. And if you don't know, sheep are highly affectionate creatures and they would often rub their heads together. So so not only was this daily parasite able to get into the flock, but if it was left unchecked, it would quickly spread throughout the flock and it would take down most of the sheep, if not all of them. So like the nose fly, the the only effective remedy for the parasite was an anointing oil that was lovingly and watchfully, vigilantly applied by the shepherd. So we see how strategic it can be to get just a little sin into one of God's sheep, to one of God's people. It it causes a little panic, causes a a, a little strain from the shepherd. and, And what's the purpose? What's the end goal? If we're not abiding with the shepherd, we are not under his care. The enemy can harm or kill us. Sin can harm or kill us. But if that wasn't bad enough, the intent is not to just get one of God's people, but it's to use one of God's people to injure all of God's people. But the good news is that God, being the good shepherd, is watching, he's waiting, he's providing and protecting so that even in the valley of the shadow of death, even at a table set in the presence of our enemies, even when sin tries to creep in like a parasite, what appears to be a great threat cannot overcome God's protection. What was meant for our harm, God is using for our good. We have no evil to fear because God is with us. Our cup overflows. We have more than what we need. And that brings us to our last point. And verse six makes it so plain when it says goodness and mercy or goodness and loving kindness shall follow us all the days of our lives. God is steadfast. It doesn't always look safe. I'm not saying it does. It it, it absolutely doesn't always feel good. But but the goodness of God, the mercy of heaven and the love of the shepherd is always with us. So when God provides we're, we're called to receive it with thanks. When he gives us rest, we are called to take it and, and not find ourselves busy or consumed with things that don't matter. When he keeps us from things that, that seem as exciting as a rushing river, but are actually things that threaten to pull us away from him, things that pull us towards certain death, we're called to get closer to God. When it seems like all hell is broken loose and a threat is right around the corner, we're called to remember that God is with us and nothing can stand against our shepherd. We're called to trust that no threat is stronger and no retreat is safer than the Lord our God. And when it seems otherwise, 
we are called to remember and live according to this truth. I shall not fear for you, O God, my good and faithful shepherd are with me. Your goodness and your mercy are with me as well. Now, that's an amazing perspective to have. It's an absolute blessing of relational position, but it starts with having a relationship with Christ. When we aren't connected to Christ, we are outside of his protection. We're outside of his provision, and we are in a world of threats and parasites and predators trying to destroy us. And these are threats that we often can't identify on our own until they've already consumed us. So the encouragement is to get connected and to stay connected to God. And if you want to follow Christ for the first time, or if you want to find a community of believers to help you live this thing out, or if you have questions or comments to share, message us. The comment section is open. Drop a comment. The DMs are open. Send us a message, or you can email us at opengroveonline at gmail.com. Let's get rooted in the reality of God together because I'm praying with you and I'm praying for you. I want you to remember this. There is a good shepherd who provides everything we need and more. With him, we lack nothing and we can be with him forever. But until that day comes, let's not be so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. Thanks for listening. Grace and peace.